fans of Ana de Armas flocked to theaters after seeing her in the trailer for yesterday. Just one problem, she's not actually in the film. Turns out, not all movie trailer decisions are good ones. Throughout the 2000s, gay panic jokes were incredibly common in mainstream American comedy movies. Frustration with the normalization of these gags reached a tipping point with the release of the first trailer for the 2011 Vince Vaughn and Kevin James comedy, The Dilemma, which began with Vaughn's character announcing, Electric cars are gay. In the wake of this trailer, an outcry emerged from queer commentators and LGBTQ organizations about the marketing for The Dilemma leaning so hard on such a cruel joke. Eventually, director Ron Howard took to the press to announce that the original trailer would be pulled, but that the line would be kept in the final film, claiming that removing the gag would, quote, endanger comedy as both entertainment and a provoker of thought. The first trailer for the period crime drama Gangster Squad included a beat in its home stretch depicting a bunch of gangsters bursting through a movie screen to shoot everyone in the theater. It all looked like the standard sort of violence you'd see in a gangster feature, or at least it did prior to July 20th, 2012, when a gunman opened fire on a movie theater during a screening of The Dark Knight Rises in Aurora, Colorado and killed 12 people. Following the Aurora, Colorado shooting, Warner Brothers Pictures announced that the initial trailer for Gangster Squad, which was set to play on certain Dark Knight Rises showings, was being pulled from theaters. A few days later, Warner Brothers delayed the release of Gangster Squad by four months to allow for reshoots that would cover a replacement sequence for the initial movie theater shootout. Kevin Smith has long been enamored with the internet and the way it can spread his artistic visions out into the world. The internet is a communications tool used the world over where people can come together to bitch about movies and share pornography with one another. In 2008, he dropped a teaser trailer for his then-upcoming movie, Zack and Miri Make a Porno, which was designed for online consumption only. The teaser didn't contain any footage from the final film, but did offer a tease of what the tone of Zack and Miri would be like, as well as the chemistry shared between lead actors Seth Rogen and Elizabeth Banks. However, in June 2008, shortly after the teaser trailer was uploaded, Kevin Smith announced that the MPA had forced the takedown of the trailer, claiming that the trailer couldn't be released because its board hadn't vetted it. Since previous internet-only trailers for Smith movies had never inspired MPA ire, the director said this decision was incredibly baffling. Apparently, though, the raunchy material contained in the teaser was considered just too transgressive for the folks at the MPA, and the trailer was taken down. The first full trailer for The Hangover Part 2, released on the last day of March 2011, certainly tees up plenty of raunchy hijinks for the wolf pack to get into in Thailand. The trailer showcases everything from Stu waking up with a gigantic tattoo on his face, to a gun going off in a strip club, to some kind of brawl happening in a monastery. In other words, it was a typical trailer. But what wasn't typical is where it was being shown. Roughly a week after it was released, the first Hangover Part 2 trailer was pulled from movie theaters because it had been screened before the PG-13 movie Source Code. This violated a rule from the MPA about R-rated movies being promoted in front of PG-13 titles. At the time, Warner Brothers emphasized that it was cooperating with the MPA and had gotten a new Hangover Part 2 trailer approved to go out on the R-rated horror sequel Scream 4. Thank goodness someone thought of the children. There were lots of trailers for Suicide Squad. Like, a lot. Heck, the movie managed to debut two radically different trailers at two separate San Diego International Comic Cons. One thing they had in common, though, was criticism over moments that were perceived to objectify and dehumanize Margot Robbie's Harley Quinn. Specifically, a clip in the second trailer lingering on Harley's backside as she bends over to pick up a stolen purse, and another scene in a separate trailer holding on her exposed chest as she changes her shirt especially earned people's ire. Once the movie was released, though, there was a small silver lining. Finally, truth in advertising. Upon the release of Suicide Squad, a barrage of articles emerged critiquing this comic book movie for treating its female characters poorly and especially letting down Robbie's committed performance as Harley Quinn with subpar writing. It turned out those sexist moments involving Harley from the Suicide Squad trailers were a perfect microcosm of larger problems in the movie they were promoting. X-Men Apocalypse featured the mutant superheroes facing off against the immortal menace of Apocalypse. To emphasize just how enormously formidable this fellow was, the first trailer for X-Men Apocalypse had Apocalypse revealing that he'd been perceived as various gods over the years, including the Hindu deity Krishna. I've been called many things over many lifetimes. Trying to hide. Ra, Krishna, Yahweh. The idea of Krishna actually being a wicked X-Men villain didn't sit right with some folks. Various Hindu organizations around the world claimed that this line was offensive to their culture and people. Others also claimed that this dialogue was indicative of a general trend in Hollywood of major American movies failing to treat Hinduism with any sort of respect. Ultimately, the protests had an effect, 
and the reference to Krishna was deleted from the final cut of X-Men Apocalypse. On paper, it's hard to imagine that any moment from a trailer for the Tigger movie could be perceived as controversial in any sense of the word. However, the initial trailer for this film stirred up some discourse thanks to its song of choice. Initially, the primary trailer for the Tigger movie was set to Third Eye Blind's Semi-Charmed Life, a bouncy tune that, devoid of context, seems perfect for matching the energy of Tigger. However, the lyrics of the song actually cover darker material about drug use and explicit sex acts. An outcry followed the trailer's release, and eventually, a Disney spokesperson came forward to claim the studio had no clue about the darker implications of Semi-Charmed Life, and that the trailer would be pulled. On the internet, however, it lives on forever. It's no secret that Saw movies are not for the faint of heart. Each installment in this franchise is packed to the gills with violent material intended to leave horror fans reaching for the nearest barf bag. Naturally, then, kids and younger viewers are not the target demo for any aspect of this franchise. However, controversy arose over the trailer for Saw 3D in the United Kingdom after a 10-year-old was allegedly scarred from watching this piece of marketing on television. Specifically, a moment in the trailer where a theater full of moviegoers are restrained in their seats before a terrifying figure reaches out from the movie screen to grab somebody in the audience was deemed especially traumatizing for this kid. After this incident and other complaints over this moment in the Saw 3D trailer, UK broadcasters banned the piece of promotional material from being aired on television in the country before 9 p.m. This maneuver was meant to limit the number of kids who could be exposed to any kind of marketing related to this entry in the Saw saga. The Paranormal Activity franchise is not about rampant blood and guts spilling out all over the silver screen, but rather lengthy periods of domestic normalcy suddenly getting upended by supernatural frights. These jump scares aren't every horror fan's cup of tea, but they've certainly proved popular enough to garner the Paranormal Activity movies a huge fan base. These kinds of scares have also given the franchise a lot of notoriety, as seen by the first trailer for Paranormal Activity 2. This piece of marketing is mostly composed of security footage of a family's seemingly empty house, until, suddenly, the camera cuts to a shot of a shadowy figure in a baby's room. It's a moment meant to give viewers a massive jolt, but for some moviegoers, it was too much scariness to handle. After debuting in theaters during screenings of The Twilight Saga Eclipse, Cinemark moviegoers registered a slew of complaints with the theater chain about how uncomfortably terrifying the trailer was, leading to theaters in Texas pulling the Paranormal Activity 2 teaser. The younger core demo of the PG-13 Eclipse was likely not an ideal audience for the first teaser for an R-rated horror movie. Typically, trailers for massive wide-release movies generate the most controversy. However, the trailer for the 2015 Roland Emmerich indie movie Stonewall was a notable exception to this rule, with this tiny movie generating lots of noise with its first big piece of marketing. The trailer for Stonewall is full of controversial moments, including its emphasis on cisgender white gay men doing all the important events in the historic 1969 Stonewall riots. This seminal moment in queer history was actually made possible through trans women of color like Marsha P. Johnson, making the erasure of the Stonewall trailer unspeakably insulting. The trailer instantly became a lightning rod for controversy, with many pointing out how it reflected the larger erasure of trans folks from the LGBTQ community. Emmerich's defense of the feature to BuzzFeed, in which he said that Stonewall needed to focus on certain characters to appeal to straight viewers, only exacerbated all the controversy. The eventually disastrous reviews for Stonewall confirmed that all the worst qualities of the initial trailer were only more apparent in the final feature. In trying to make a broadly appealing project, Emmerich only generated trailers and a movie that became punchlines. The first trailer for Peter Rabbit could have easily been cobbled together by an artificial intelligence program. Beginning with serious narration, accompanied by a chorus of angelic bird singers, intoning that this is the story of Peter, the titular critter soon rams into those singing birds and kickstarts the trailer's irreverent tone. From here, the first trailer for Peter Rabbit depicts Peter and all his animal comrades partying the night away. Peter himself is especially rambunctious, doing a rabbit version of twerking and throwing out lettuce leaves like they're dollars at a strip club. The whole trailer ends with lengthy screaming, like so many other trailers for modern kids' movies. Needless to say, the endlessly generic Peter Rabbit trailers were not popular with many people, especially since it felt like a sacrilegious adaptation of the classic children's book character crafted by Beatrix Potter. Major British media outlets like The Guardian were especially disgusted by the trailer, viewing it as an excessive and misguided attempt to Americanize a distinctly British and kind-hearted literary icon like Peter Rabbit. The fact that the whole trailer felt so cribbed from other modern family movies only exacerbated the outrage. Midway through the second trailer for Terminator Genesis, this movie's incarnation of Sarah Connor suddenly encounters an adult version of her son John from the future. This happy reunion is cut short once John is shot, and it's revealed that this freedom fighter is now a cyborg. John Connor has turned evil, and the trailer teases him as the big baddie of Genesis. 
The savior of the world in Terminator 2 Judgment Day is now positioned as the person who could ultimately destroy all of existence. Online chatter about the trailer criticized why this massive plot turn had been given away months before Genesis reached theaters. Even the director of Genesis, Alan Taylor, told Uproxx that he directed the film with the intent that John Connor's big reveal would be a surprise to the audience, not something they'd already witnessed countless times in marketing materials. The choice to reveal this key plot detail in the trailer dominated the pre-release coverage of Genesis and tainted the feature's overall image rather than get people stoked for a new Terminator adventure. Back in 2009, every new movie starring high school characters was perceived by studio executives as a new attempt to get some of the mountains of cash generated by the high school musical franchise. It didn't matter whether or not the feature itself fit that mold, the studio was still going to market it in a manner that evoked memories of Troy Bolton and company. This phenomenon was especially apparent in the trailer for the 2009 film Bandslam, which tried to sell the motion picture as something breezy and light, which in fact it wasn't. Look how big is this whole band slam thing around here? Texas high school football big. In the wake of the box office failure of Band Slam, Deadline ran a lengthy piece analyzing the various failures of the film's trailer, particularly how this piece of marketing sanded off the edges of the feature's appealingly adult tone. There were also complaints about how the trailers misled audiences into thinking star Vanessa Hudgens was just playing a rehash of her high school musical character instead of an exciting new and more complicated figure. Bandslam is the rare example of a movie trailer that garnered controversy after the film it was promoting had been released, as it was only then that people realized just how inaccurate the trailer's advertising was. The 2017 feature, Basmati Blues, from writer-director Dan Barron centers on Brie Larson's character, a rice scientist who goes to India and ends up rebelling against her employers and falling in love with the son of a local farmer. It's a standard white savior narrative that filters the struggles of Indians through the eyes of a white American lady. Upon the release of the first Basmati Blues trailer, criticism ran rampant over various moments in the trailer, which were critiqued as further stereotypes about India. These included gags entirely centered around mocking the fractured English spoken by the film's Indian characters. This is how we making hello. <laughs> A traditional greeting. Everything about the film's first big piece of marketing was perceived as being wildly out of touch with reality and furthering harmful stereotypes that Hollywood had been peddling for decades. The eventual reviews for Basmati Blues indicated that the initial flaws apparent in the trailer were also in the final cut of the film. Before Tom Cruise's first movie as Jack Reacher was unleashed into movie theaters in December 2012, the biggest controversy surrounding the feature was about Cruise's height. Fans of the books took to the internet in anger over the perception that Cruise was way too short to portray a fictional character who's supposed to be 6 foot 5 according to the original novels penned by Lee Child. However, after the debut of Jack Reacher, another aspect of this production caught the ire of people. Specifically, a shot from the trailer involving an explosion didn't make it into the final cut of the film, an omission one moviegoer sought legal action over. In 2013, just months after Jack Reacher premiered, a New Zealand moviegoer filed a complaint after Paramount Pictures dared to include that memorable exploding cliff in the trailer but didn't feature the stunt in the actual movie. Paramount Pictures eventually gave this fellow the money he spent on a Jack Reacher ticket back, but the controversy over this omitted action beat is now forever etched into the history of the Jack Reacher character. Considering all this noise over this particular Jack Reacher trailer moment, Paramount and everyone else involved in this Tom Cruise star vehicle likely wish all the controversy over this action film had remained centered around the leading man's stature. Remember, you wanted this. Though Anna de Armas had already appeared in major movies like Blade Runner 2049, she blew up to a new level of prominence in 2019 thanks to her leading role as Marta in the hit film Knives Out. However, originally, de Armas was supposed to appear in another major 2019 film, Yesterday. In this feature about a world in which everyone but one man has forgotten the Beatles, de Armas was supposed to play another love interest for Himesh Patel's protagonist Jack Malik. This subplot was eventually deleted after test screening viewers thought this romantic affair diluted their investment in Jack as a character. De Armas remained in the film for so long that she even appeared in the trailers for Yesterday, which eventually got the movie into some hot water with dissatisfied moviegoers. In 2022, a lawsuit emerged suing Universal for misleading trailers that featured moments emphasizing the presence of De Armas. Some viewers alleged that they were convinced to rent Yesterday from digital retailers because De Armas had shown up in the trailer. By 2023, the lawsuit had been dismissed by a U.S. district judge. Still, the very existence of the lawsuit showed how riled up people can get over misleading trailer moments, especially when they involve actors as beloved as De Armas. Since the earliest days of his filmmaking career, the creator-director Garth Edwards has always loved shooting his movies in real locations. 
Back when he was promoting his directorial debut, Monsters, in 2010, Edwards explained to D Magazine that he believed there was an authenticity to the performances and scenery captured in shooting on location that you couldn't replicate on a soundstage. Since those days, Edwards has shot his biggest blockbusters in real places and then added CGI monsters, droids, and mechanical humans on top of those recognizable locales. Unfortunately, the marketing for the creator went too far merging reality with sci-fi imagery when it came to the film's second trailer. It reportedly employed footage of an actual devastating explosion that occurred in Beirut in 2020, killing over 200 people and leaving an estimated 300,000 others homeless. Given all the deaths and destruction that was caused by that real-world event, many found it to be in incredibly poor taste that footage from this explosion would be used to promote a big Disney blockbuster. Edwards later explained in a Reddit Q&A that the footage had only appeared in the trailer as an accident and a result of VFX artists often using archival footage as a basis for temporary VFX. He also clarified that this footage is not in the final cut of the creator. Still, the damage was already done.